Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever our Jewish travelers are tuning in from. It's our pleasure today to be joined by Alec Nakamuli. Alec was born in 1943 in Alexandria, Egypt, and in 1956, his family left Egypt and settled in Switzerland. In 1966, he moved to London to pursue a master's degree, and since then, he has been an active member of the Association of Egyptian Jews, and he is currently the chairman of Sephardi Voices UK. We're really honored to have you here with us today to learn about Jewish Egypt, especially so close to Pesach. Um, if folks want to share where they're tuning in from in the chat, feel free to share questions and say hi. Um, and I'm so excited to, to learn about this history with you. Okay, well, thank you, Mira, and thank you, My Jewish Learning, for inviting me to speak about the Jews from Egypt. Well, there has been a continuous present Jewish present in Egypt for millennium. I will not actually go through, in, for the sake of time, the biblical uh, sort of history, which in any case, I assume you know better than I do. But I will start at the Middle Ages, at the time of the Arab invasion of Egypt. But I will focus mainly on the period between the mid-19th and the mid-20th century, which was the golden years of the Jewish community in Egypt before their decline. Because this is a spoiler, at its peak, the Jewish community in Egypt numbered 85,000. There are today no more than eight Jews left in Egypt, four in Cairo and four in Alexandria. And after that, I will talk about what is left and how do we preserve our memory. So let's try and share the screen. Here we are. Sorry, there's a problem here. Excuse me. Can you cut the things on the side? Because I want to put it on full screen. Um. Just for I one minute. I can't necessarily uh, cut them, I don't think, but try try going full screen. I think it should be okay. No, I, one minute. You. Ah, here we are. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, as I said, we will start. We will start in the Middle Ages. So in 642, Egypt was conquered by the Arabs. Islam became the official religion. Jews gradually returned and a new capital, Fostat, next to today's Cairo, was created. And as the Muslims in, uh, installed the Dhimmi system, which was a tolerance of monotheistic religions, so Christianity and Judaism, but with let's say some restrictions, they had to pay a tax, they could not ride horses, but had to ride donkeys, their buildings couldn't be taller than mosques, etc., etc. And throughout the century, centuries, and this is similar across all the Arab world, the fate of the Jews, depending on how strictly the local beys or pashas would impose the dhimma. There were at that time some very uh, sort of very learned rabbis who emerged. We had Rabbi Saadia ben Joseph, who compiled the Sidur and translated the Torah into Arabic. He then moved on to become the Gaon of the Academy of Sura in Babylon. And then in 970, we had the conquest by the Fatimids. The Fatimids were a Shia tribe from Tunisia claiming descendants from Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. And we saw the encouraged immigration of Jews from Babylon, Tunisia, Israel, alternating periods of prosperity and repression. So in 1011, for instance, we had the mad Caliph al-Hakim who forced Jews into a sort of ghetto, the Hat al-Yahud, the Jewish quarter, that was 400 years before the Venice ghetto. But however, it was the only instance in the history of Jews in Egypt where that restriction was imposed. 
And as soon as his successor arrived, he lifted it and Jews were more or less allowed to live where they wanted. Although, obviously, as you can imagine, they continued to congregate amongst each other in the Hat al Yahud. And then, of course, in 1165, we have Maimonides, who arrives in uh, Egypt. He was the court physician to the Sultan Salah al Din. He died in Fostat in 1204, and he wrote the Mishneh Torah and, uh, in Egypt, as well as the Guide to the Perplexed, which he wrote in Arabic. And then we have, of course, the uh, discovery of the Cairo Geniza. The Cairo Geniza was discovered by Solomon Schechter, as you probably know, between 1896-97 at the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Cairo. And he brought back 193,000 documents to Cambridge. Now, as you probably know, the strictly speaking, in a Geniza, you only need to deposit uh, documents, religious documents carrying the name of God. But the Cairo Geniza, you could arguably say, was one of the very early recycling depots because it contained not only prayer and Talmudic or religious documents. For instance, you see here is the illustration. It's the manuscript draft of Maimonides Mishne Torah in his hand. And we also have fragments of the original Book of Wisdom by Ben Sira, a precursor to the Christian ecclesiastics. But this document, when we found it, also contained countless secular documents, which gave us a unique view of Jewish life, mainly between the 10th and the 13th centuries. Legal documents, deeds of sales, debt recognition, some of the very first checks and letters of credit, payment records to laborers, private cons correspondence, even exercises by students, and there is an, even a page of lines which was given of punishment. And a lot of these documents, if you go, are available online, which I strongly recommend you go and observe. Then in 1517, Egypt becomes part of the Ottoman Empire under the Sultan Selim I. And he, as the Ottomans had attracted Jews in 1492 after the Inquisition, they attracted Jews into Egypt. They, however, used them as civil servants. And in particular, they used them as tax collectors, which, of course, did not make them very popular. And uh, they were shelly bees. And in fact, the, uh, the Cairo Jews used to celebrate Purim Mitzrayim, to, to recall the fact that there was one of these Shelley Bees tax collectors, a certain De Castro, who was actually lynched by the mob. Then we get to Bonaparte's expedition in Egypt in 1799, where he found, you know, there at that time the population was about 7,000 Jews. He remained there for three years. And as you remember, he not only brought with him an army, but he also brought him a cohort, brought with him a cohort of scientists, archaeologists, botanists, uh, archaeologists, who actually drew every single plant, every single animal, and every single monument which they found, which they compiled in a beautiful collection of 26 books called La Description de l'Egypte. And that is really when... Uh, Europe became aware that there had been a very advanced civilization in Egypt stretching back to about minus 3,000. But when he left, the Ottoman Empire was weakened and there was one of the sultans, Muhammad Ali, who was of Albanian origin, who seized power. He actually massacred all his uh, rivals and he encouraged Jewish immigration from Italy, from Turkey, from Greece. But most importantly, he distanced, him, distanced himself from the Ottoman Empire. He actually sort of negotiated an agreement with uh, 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 Istanbul that he would pay the taxes, but they would let him run the country as more or less he wished, as long as he paid the taxes. And his dynasty actually stretched all the way down to the King Farouk, who we will see later was deposed in 1952. There were even actually in 1835, 
some failed negotiations with Sir Moses Montefiore, where uh, what Montefiore tried to persuade Muhammad Ali to do was to create a Jewish buffer state between Egypt and Turkey. But those discussions did never didn't come to anything. And then in 1861, we have the civil war in the United States. And you're going to say to me, what has that got to do with Egypt? Well, that created a shortage of cotton, which mainly came from the southern, the, the, you know, the South United States. And there was a boom of cotton. The prices quadrupled on the world market. And that is where everybody discovered that there was cotton in Egypt the long fiber cotton, which was actually of higher quality than the American cotton. And everybody rushed to Egypt. And then in 1869, we have the opening of the Suez Canal and Egypt became a sort of golden rush state. Everybody rushed there, uh, immigrants from uh, the, the Levant, from Middle East, from France, from Italy, from Malta, from Syria, North Africa, etc. Egypt became a, a boom country. And at that time, the Jewish population numbered about 30,000. But then, however, uh, after the opening of the Suez Canal, the Khedive Ismail actually ran into financial difficulty and uh, sort of fearing that he would go bankrupt. In 1882, Britain occupied Egypt mainly to secure the passage of the Suez Canal, which, as we know, was their privileged route to, uh, to India. During World War I, we had Ashkenazi immigration, which were expelled from Palestine from the Turks. In 1920s, at the time of the proclamation of the Turkish Republic uh, by Kemal Ataturk, we had massive immigration of Jews from Salonika and in particular from Smyrna. And at that time, the Jewish population had risen to about 60,000. In 1917, we have the Balfour Declaration and the Zionist Federation of Egypt was created. And then in 1922, Egypt became independent under King Fuad, who was a great, great grandchild of Mohammed Ali. And the Jewish community at that time was probably the most prosperous in the Middle East. And Egypt was a model of convivial tolerance. All nationalities, all religions cohabited together, traded together, socialized together. And I can give you one very typical example. I am sure that you must have heard of Rudolf Hess, the German war critic, uh, criminal. He was actually the Nazi war criminal. He was actually born in Alexandria because the Hess family had actually owned in Egypt at the time the largest import-export company. They were a very established and respected German family operating in Egypt. And my grandfather actually worked for the Hess family before setting up his own business. And one afternoon, he was invited to tea with my grandmother, and O's supreme honor was given little Rudolf to bounce on his knees. And my grandfather always used to say, if I had known, I would have thrown him on the floor. And the, Egy the Egyptian community was actually very integrated and very influential. For instance, they contributed significantly to Egyptian political life. Way back in the 19th century, Victor Sanua campaigned in his uh, newspaper against corruption and the British presence named after Abu Nadara uh, because he wore glasses, which means the son of glasses. And the motto of his newspaper was L'Egypte aux Égyptiens, Egypt to the Egyptians. And then we find Jewish names like Felix Benzaken, Victor Sonsino, David Hazan, who were active members of the Waft party led by Saad Zaglul Pasha, which was the main party calling for independence. And they actually use a Leon de Crastro as Jewish, obviously, as itinerant ambassador of the Waft. So traveling around Europe and traveling around the United States to try and persuade those governments to support uh, Egyptian independence. After independence in 1922 under King Fouad, Joseph Aslan Katawi Pasha 
was the first finance minister of independent Egypt, the chief rabbi, Haim Nahum Efendi, who came from Istanbul, Turkey, was the, a senator and used to write most of the king's speeches. The queen, Queen Nazli, had two Jewish ladies in waiting. And it is also rumored that the king, Fuad, had Jewish mistresses. But very importantly, the king would make a point of attending Kol Nidre service in the main Cairo synagogue on the eve of Yom Kippur to manifest his solidarity with his Jewish subjects. And then totally on the other, let's say, extreme of the political rainbow, we have Jack Rosenthal, Hillel Schwartz, and Henri Curiel, who were founding members of the Egyptian Communist Party. That actually, up until the war, was what I would call an intellectual communist party, not really sort of looking after workers and the trade unions. And then after the war, uh, with the rise of Zionism and the the, uh, the independent, uh, Israeli independence, the birth of the state of Israel, then actually the, um, uh, the communist party and the trade unions in particular expelled the Jews, if anything, because Zionism was considered as bourgeois. If we look at the Jewish contribution to economic development, we have the same names as we see in Joseph Aslan Katawi, Salvatore Sicurel, Sir Victor Harari Pasha on the boards of the national bank, so the central bank and the Misra bank, the main commercial bank in Egypt. We also had a lot of independent banks, sort of families, Mosseri, Suarez, Rolo, Zilka, Dominash. The stock and the cotton exchanges would close on Jewish holidays, because if not, there wouldn't have been anybody there. And one of my cousins was actually chairman of the Alexandria Cotton Exchange, which was the main exchange for trading cotton. There were also Jews active in agriculture, a large agricultural estates, cotton, sugarcane, flour mills, food. And then obviously we had a very active middle class of professionals, lawyers, medics, journalists, and mainly also they were very active in retail. All of the main department stores, Anno, Sicurel, Salon Vert, Bencion, Gatenio, or Osdibac, were actually Jewish. And here you have a photo of the flagship Sicurel department store in Cairo. Um, yeah, what is interesting is that those brand names have renamed, although they are obviously following expulsion, no longer owned by Jewish families. They have been nationalized and resold. In about 20, 2004, I was in Aswan and I saw a massive mass crowd gathering outside a store named Ben Sion. And I asked, you know, what is happening here? Is this a riot? Is this an anti-Jewish demonstration? And he said, no, 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 it's the first day of the sales. So the brand names of those stores are still remaining today. And here you have an inside view, more recent, taken about three, four years of the main annual department store in Alexandria. As you can see, the, lab the departments are labeled in Arabic and also in French, because among this whole community of immigrants, French was a lingua franca. When a Greek wanted to speak to an Armenian or to an Italian, they would speak French, in spite of the fact, let's say, that uh, Egypt was more under the British political sphere. And then we have uh, in urbanization, major developments which were financed and led by Jews. So in Alexandria, we south of Alexandria was up until 1900, 1910, swamped by marshes. And then there was a family Joseph Smuha, who was born in Baghdad, but who actually moved to Manchester before coming to Egypt. And in 1925, he drained the swamps south of Alexandria, and he founded the Smuha Garden City, based on the models of the English uh, garden cities, like Welling Garden Cities. And you can see photos there of some of the villas, slightly sort of Bauhaus style. And also there was a 
very active uh, sports club, the Gaz the Smuha Club, where uh, there would be horse racing and also tennis, squash, cricket, and all the games. So that was in Alexandria, and in Cairo, the first uh, the the main the public transport system of buses and trams was actually created by the Suarez Jewish family. What you have here is a photo of their first buses that were used. And actually in Arabic, people wouldn't say, I'm going to ride the tram. They would say, Nirkab el Suarez, I'm going to ride the Suarez. That name stuck. And then we have very strong Jewish uh, cu cultural contribution. So Murad Farag Lisha was a prominent poet, a philosopher and a grammarian. Then James Zaradel Sanua, a relative of the one I mentioned earlier, who pioneered modern colloquial theater. He was known as the Egyptian Moliere. In sport, Salvatore Sicurel, leader of the family from the Sicurel department, saw captain the silver medal, the team, uh, fencing team, which won a silver medal at the Amsterdam Olympics. And Jews would play in the national basketball team. Uh, you know, the Maccabi teams in Alexandria and Cairo contributed several players to the Egyptian uh, national basketball team. A lot of the dancers uh, were and singers were Jewish, like Serena, Zaki Murad, Dawood Hosni, real name David Levine, Levy. And then really what you ought to understand is that Egyptian cinema was the uh, most important in the Arab world. And that is why you obviously know that written Arabic is identical, but there are different dialects and accents in Arabic. So Moroccan Arabic is not the same as Egyptian Arabic or as Palestinian Arabic or as Syrian Arabic, but Egyptian Arabic, colloquial Arabic was the one that was the most widely understood basically because of the Egyptian film cinema which was distributed throughout the whole Arab world. They would produce about 150 to 200 uh, films a year. They were the sort of Arab Hollywood or Bollywood. And there were two what we would call moguls. One was uh, Talat Ha Pasha, who was Egyptian, but the other one was Togo Mizrahi from an Italian Jewish family. And he was one, he created the Alexandria uh, film studios and developed a whole chain of cinemas. And also you then had lots of Jewish actresses and actors. Rakia Ibrahim, real name Rachel Levy, Camelia, real name Lilian Cohen, Shalom, who was a male comic actor, and the famous uh, Leila Murad, who was the daughter of a Hazan, of a, of a cantor. So she was a singer, a dancer, and a uh, sort of Egyptian uh, film star, you ought to realize that at that time, a lot of the actresses were either Jews or Christian because the Muslim girls were shy originally about appearing on camera. And what I'm going to show you here now is an excerpt from one of Leila Murad's uh, uh, films. Sorry. Um, is there supposed to be audio volume? Okay. <laughs> So this is a film called Leila the Flower Girl and she's asking who is going to buy flowers from me? Me she was an absolute star 
and she is still known and remembered today, although probably few people know that she was Jewish. And uh, actually in 1952, after the revolution, she was chosen to sing the song of the revolution instead of the famous Um Kalsum. So what was Jewish life like in Egypt? So first of all, let's look at the religious communities. So you had two main communities. You had the Rabbanites, Sephardi, Mizrahi, and an Ashkenazi minority. And then, uh, so there was an Ashkenazi minority, but strong enough in Cairo to have their own synagogue. In Alexandria, they were not enough, and they would join the Sephardi uh, Mizrahi synagogues. And then you had the Karaites, who maintained their independence as a sect. They are they only recognize the Pentateuch, do not, for instance, celebrate Hanukkah or Purim. They repudiate the oral law. They reject Tefillin and Mezuzot as amulets. And actually, during Nida, so during menstruation, women aren't even allowed to sit at the table with the men. And those two communities uh, sort of cohabited, actually. And at one point, intermarriage was frowned upon or even forbidden, except that the, uh, there was a rabbi, Haim Nahum Effendi, who le led a reconciliation in the 1920s. And as I said, the Jewish community at its peak numbered about 85,000 after World War II. And as you must have gathered, they were mainly a community of immigrants. And if you look at the social sort of strata, we would say you would have a top level of aristocrats, large landowners, rich bankers, industrialists, also involved in politics. You then had a very prosperous middle business and professional middle class. But then you also had an impoverished layer, mainly indigenous Egyptian Jews, concentrated around the Jewish quarter, the Halte Yahud, close to poverty and assisted through charity. The foreigners who maintained their passport were protected by a system of capitulations. Those were bilateral treaties between the Ottoman Empire and other country, whereby foreign subjects were not subject to Egyptian law, but were subject to the law of their respective countries. They were exempt of local prosecution, and they were judged by foreign judges in what was known as the mixed tribunals, the tribunal mixed. As I mentioned, French was a lingua franca. Everybody spoke several languages. And on the whole, it was an extremely pleasant life. We occupied spacious villas or apartments. We had servants, very active social life, sport clubs, beach in Alexandria, regular visits, for instance, by the Comédie Française every year, Italian opera companies. It really, really was an extremely pleasant life. The Cairo and the Alexandria synagogues, op sorry, excuse me, communities operated independently. There was no overarching, let's say, national authority. Like in England, we have the Board of Deputies or the Consistoire in France or the Beth Din. So there were 18 synagogues in Cairo. There were 12 in Alexandria, plus private oratories that would have been run by some of the rich families like the Mosseris or the Benash. Every community maintained their own charities, so old people's homes, orphanages. There was a, a charity to provide dowries to girls from impoverished families to enable them to get married. Both communities ran their own hospitals. And there was also a charity known as the Good Delay, the Drop of Milk, and I'll talk about that later, which was mainly looking at disadvantaged children. Um, there were also lots of schools. So the Aguillon, the Katawi, the Benash, my grandfather created schools mainly dedicated to teaching French or Italian or English to Jews from families who only spoke Arabic. May A, to give them a better chance of gaining employment, or also perhaps uh, with a view on the future if they would have had to leave so that when they arrived in Europe or America, they would actually speak the language. There was the Lycée de l'Union Juive in Alexandria, which was created by the Bnei Brit, 
following the accusation of ritual murder in a Catholic school. The um, Alliance Israelite Universelle actually had created Jewish schools at the, at the second half of the 19th century, but they were actually taken over by the Jewish communities. But uh, mainly the comfortable families sent their kids to French or English schools. The Lycée Francais, where I went in Alexandria, the famous Victoria College, British Boys School, or even some of them spent, sent their kids to Catholic Jesuit schools, like the Collège Saint-Marc in Alexandria or Notre Dame de Sion. The indigenous Jews were more Alex, religious. I'm so, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Are, are there supposed to be slides right now? No. Okay, I'm coming right. back to slides in two minutes. Don't worry. All right, great. Just checking in. No, don't worry. Thanks for checking. So the indigenous Jews were more religiously observant. There was a rabbi, one of the famous rabbis in Alexandria was Rabbi Prato, who came from Florence in, and arrived in Alexandria in 1927. And he wrote to a friend in Italy, I am surrounded by a community going to pot from a spiritual point of view. Few homes were strictly kosher, particularly not immigrant homes. In my home, for instance, we would not eat pork, but we ate shellfish. After Shabbat, there was no service. There was no kiddush at the synagogue. But in Alexandria, everybody walked down to the Brazilian coffee store to buy coffee and cakes. And of course, as we're approaching Passover, as we know, as Sephardi Mizrahi, we eat rice at Pesach. We um, eat a lot of lamb and the matzot were baked at the synagogue. The synagogues had their own matzot oven and we used to have the sort of classical matzot, as you know, with the little holes in them. But also with it, they would bake very, very thin matzot, which could be used like phyllo pastry and could be used even uh, during Passover to bake uh, kosher le Pesach borekas. In terms of life cycle events, when it came to the bar mitzvah for boys, laying tefillin was the most important. Most important was not being called up on the Saturday to read the portion, but was the Thursday before that Shabbat where you would actually lay tefillin for the first time. And actually the expression was, you would say, you wouldn't say Sam is doing having his bar mitzvah next month. You would say Sam is laying tefillin next month. There was also, and I'll show you a photo, a Bat Hai celebration for girls. Weddings would often be held in the house of the groom, the Hatan. The daughter's family would provide a dowry and a trousseau, but the husband also had to deposit, in many cases, what was known as a counter diary, which was a sum of money to protect the family in case he either died prematurely or he had, there was a divorce and he had walked away. And we used to keep, as I said, close uh, relationship with the family abroad. An interesting uh, sort of sideline of this, we would hold monthly conversations with our members of the family in uh, France or in Italy and censorship operated. All letters arriving or sent out of Egypt from abroad were censored and with no effort to, to hide it, the envelopes were just slipped open and stuck back together with old pieces of newspapers. And when you actually wanted to have a phone call abroad, you actually had to book it through the exchange, what we call the trunk, and you would book the call for, let's say, next week on a Tuesday at three o'clock in the afternoon. And you had to declare in which language you were going to speak. And we would say, for instance, we would speak in French. But of course, what happened most often in the heat of the conversation, you would break into Italian or English, and you would hear a voice shouting down the line, parlez français, parlez français, French, speak French, because the guy who was listening in couldn't follow anymore. Okay, let's try and get back to the... So I hope this has given you a view on our life there. Right, uh, hang on. Sorry, excuse me.
you want to try to go to uh, someone in the chat mentioned going to slideshow? Yeah, I know. That's what, ah, now here we are. Right. So here's a photo of a Bathai in Alexandria where all the girls aged 12, 13 would actually take part in this cemetery dressed in white. It reminds you a bit of the Catholic Confirmation or Catechism, uh, Communion, but never mind. Anyway, so that was the life there during the golden years. But then, of course, things started to go downhill. In 1936, King Farouk was crowned. And there we began to see the rise of anti-Semitism and in particularly the Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan al-Muslamin, which was founded by Hassan al-Banna and Saeed Qutb. There was also a Egyptian youth movement which was created, the Misr al-Fatat, and these young kids would sort of parade up and down the streets in green shirts, and you can you you, you can see where the inspiration from those came from. The capitulations came to an end, which actually was a good thing because at least all citizens were now equal. But during World War II, Farouk and some officers were pro-Nazi. There was a telegram found in the German archives in Berlin from Farouk to Hitler a few months before the Battle of El Alamein, where uh, Farouk said, me and my people, I we are united in wishing for the victory of Germany to liberate us from the British yoke. There were also a group of officers, Egyptian officers, who were passing on to the Germans uh, maps and documents showing the location and British of British troops. And actually, some of them were arrested a couple of months before El Alamein on a felucca, a boat on the Nile. And one of the ones, one of their members was actually Anwar El Sadat the future president of Egypt who signed the peace treaty with Israel. But as we know, 1942, thank goodness, the victory of El Alamein, the Eighth Army of Montgomery defeating the Africa Corps of Rommel, and very close. El Alamein is less than 100 kilometers for, from Alexandria. Uh, my uncle lived up across the road from the British embassy in Cairo, and he told me that the sky was black because the embassy was burning documents and the embassy had actu ev actually evacuated all the women and children. A lot of Jews then left and moved south in, anti uh, in, in fearing a German victory, either moving to Sudan or moving down to South Africa. But actually, as we know, thank goodness it was a victory. And I was actually probably conceived in the celebrations and rejoicing following the victory of El Alamein, because I was born exactly nine months later in August 1943. At the end of the war, in November 1945, we there were riots on the anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, and that was a sort of phenomenon which repeated itself throughout the years. And in 1945, the Ashkenazi synagogue in Cairo was destroyed. However, it was rebuilt and uh, the rebuilding was financed by the Egyptian government. In 1947 came in the nationality laws. All companies had to employ at least 75% of Egyptian staff and have 51% of paid up capital in Egypt. And that's where a lot of Jews took up Egyptian nationality. And we will see later the consequences that had. In December 1947, as we know, we had the partition vote on Israel-Palestine uh, at the United Nations, gave again uh, rise to riots. And in May 48, we have the Israel independence. And that was the first Arab-Israeli war in May 48, 48-49. Um, there were riots, there were lootings, there were mass arrests. And the Egyptian authorities seized the opportunity to arrest not only a lot of Jews who were accused of being Zionists, but also communists and Muslim brothers. In 1949, the mixed courts, the tribunal mix, were abolished. And that's where you had the first big wave of emigration of Jews. 15 to 20,000 Jews left, some of them semi-officially to Israel. They would first go to France or to Cyprus and then go on to Israel. But the majority of what I would call upper and business class remained. And then in 
January 1952, there was an incident on the Suez Canal where the British army killed about 40 Egyptian policemen in Ismailia. And there was riots and protests against that. The um, And that was the sort of riots known as the burning of Cairo. Uh, the uh, There was Jewish stores which were attacked. The famous... Uh, what was it called? There was one very famous hotel which was burnt down. A lot of Jewish businesses were burnt down. And here, for instance, is a photo of the uh, flagship Sikorel store after those riots, which I showed you, you know, 10 minutes ago. But actually, more important was that the country was seething. They were suffering from the humiliation of the defeat by Israel in the War of Independence. Uh, and on top of that, they were revolted by the dissolute life that King Farouk left. He was not managing the affairs of the country. He was leading a dissolute life of gambling, traveling, gambling in Egyptian and foreign casinos, uh, womanizing. Uh, friends of my parents, actually, Farouk went to a party and asked, who is this lovely young lady in the green dress? and her parents shipped her off on the first plane uh, out of Cairo the next day. And that is where in 1952, there was the coup led by the free officers. Farouk abdicated and uh, the, the government was taken over by, as I said, the free officers. The Republic was proclaimed, led by General Naguib, although he emerged, it was seen later that he was a figurehead. And this is an interesting photo. So in 19, in September 1952, so the first Yom Kippur after the uh, revolution, uh, General Naguib, which you can see here in the middle, made a point of attending the Kol Nidre service at the main Shah Hashemaim synagogue in Cairo to try and reassure the Jewish population that... Uh, everything would continue, they had nothing to fear. And that lulled a lot of Jews, including my family, into a false sense of security. I mean, it's easy to look back with hindsight now and say, well, why didn't they leave? Um, you know, we had the example of the German and, and Jews in, in Germany and Austria, but remember, the majority of the businesses were not easily transferable. Uh, and it was a comfortable life. My father, since 1952, used to mutter, ce pays n'est plus pour nous. This country is no longer for us. But my mother wanted to stay. Uh, the prospect of leaving nice, comfortable life in warm Alexandria and go to Paris or London in the fog and the snow and the rain with no service, servants was not exactly immediately appealing. Then in 1953, we had the famous Operation Susanna, also known as the Lavon Affair. It was a rather botched plan by Israeli military intelligence to carry out bombs and sabotage to create unrest in Egypt and persuade the US and Britain that the Nasser regime was unreliable and encouraged Jews to emigrate to Israel. The plan was to deposit bombs in cinemas and offices and post offices. They did not do any damage. But then one of the group, Philip Nathanson, was arrested outside the Rio cinema in Alex when his bomb went off prematurely. All the others were rounded up and tortured. They were trialed. Two of them, which you see here, Marzouk and uh, Azar, were actually hung and Kaddish was sent in all the synagogues in Egypt at the moment of the execution. And the others, uh, Nathanson, uh, Levi, Dassa, and uh, Marcel Nino were put to prison and condemned for life uh, imprisonment. However, they were uh, swapped during a uh, prisoner exchange after the 1967 war. And they went back to Israel. And actually, when Marcel Nino got married, she was given away at a wedding by Golda Meir. And then, of course, we come to the Suez affair. 
By 1954, Nasser had moved Naguib aside and had seized power. In 1956, he nationalized the Suez Canal. And that's what triggered off the Suez War, uh, the joint tripartite operation between Israel, France, and England to try and liberate the canal. Um, actually, it, uh, it, it sort of it was a failure because America intervened and and uh, forced France and England to stop the attack. Uh, at that time, it was President Eisenhower, and he was campaigning for re-election in November 56. And he said, we couldn't on one hand condemn the Russians for occupying Hungary, because this was happening at the same time as a Hungarian uprising, and at the same time condone a change of regime in Egypt. So he actually positioned the US Sixth Fleet between the British and French ships and the Egyptian coastline, saying to them, well, if you're shooting on, if you're bombing Egypt, you are bombing us. So the war ended, there was a ceasefire. Um, but then, of course, that led to nationalization and expulsion, all the British, all the French, and a lot of Jews were expelled, including my family. So that is when 30,000 Jews were expelled or had to leave. We were sort of assets were confiscated. We were allowed to leave with one suitcase and 50 pounds with very unpleasant and intimate searches at departure. All the businesses that were nationalized, assets were confiscated. And the Egyptian nationals who had taken them particularly to protect their businesses when the national wars came were stripped on their nationality and their passports or transit documents were stamped exit visa without return. We then go to the 1967 six day war, two to 3000 Jews remain, mass arrest, imprisonment, hard labor and expulsion. By 1973, there were less than a thousand Jews left. And again, they were very badly treated. And as I said, today, there are eight Jews remaining in Egypt, four in Cairo and four in Alexandria. So let's go back and say, look now at what is left. There is a fair amount of Judaica and religious sites left in Egypt. So here are some of the Sifrei Torah, which are left in Cairo. Here you see the Sifrei Torah at the Eliyahu Hanavi Synagogue in Alexandria. As you see, they are the Sephardi Mizrahi uh, scrolls, which are encased in uh, silver or wood uh, or leather cases. This is the main Cairo, uh, Shah Hashamayim, Gates of Heaven Synagogue in Cairo on Adli Street. It was restored by the Egyptian government for its century, centenary sorry, in 2007. This is the interior of the Shah Hashemaim Synagogue. This is the Ashkenazi Synagogue in Cairo, which is still standing. This is the Musadari Karait Synagogue. As you can see, a rather spectacular building in sort of art deco with lotus flowers. And you will notice that there are no seats, no chairs, because the Karaites, like actually the Muslims, would pray either standing down or sitting or kneeling on the floor. But then there are several other synagogues. Now, the Cairo and Alexandria communities took two different approaches. The Alexandria community decided when all the Jews had left and there were only about 150 Jews left in Alexandria, decided that they would sell a lot of the synagogues, which had, to a certain extent, no historical uh, interest for real estate development. And with those funds, they would actually maintain the two main synagogues that were left, the Eliyahu Hanavi and the Menashe, and also pay for hospital bills, food, charitable donation to the elderly uh, people who were remaining. But Cairo decided not to do that. They did not destroy any, uh, pull down or sell any synagogue. And this is one of them, the Rab Kapusi synagogue, which, and you go to these synagogues today and you have the impression that somebody walked out 60 years ago and nobody's ever returned. 
Full credit, however, to the Egyptian government, the uh, synagogues are guarded by the police against riots or manifestations or whatever. In Cairo, we have the yeshiva of uh, Maimonides, Rab Moshe, which actually, these were his consulting rooms, and you can see there is water. In 2007, there was water seeping up from the floor and flooding the synagogue, but, and also next to it, there was a, uh, there was a synagogue which had been built much later, which had been destroyed by an earthquake. And the Egyptian government again chose to restore and renovate it. And it was that renovation was completed three years later. This is the restored uh, Rab Moshe synagogue. If we look at cemeteries, this is a photo of the Basatin Cemetery in Cairo, one of the probably the largest Jewish cemetery in the Middle East. But you can see that the tombstones, the, the graves are bare. In about 19, mid 1960s, there was a new commercial street which was <clears throat> driven down central Cairo and shops and restaurants were opening. And where do you get marble for decoration? You go to the Christian or to the Jewish cemeteries and you take the tombstones. So the tombs haven't been actually desecrated, but Practically all the tombstones have been removed. For instance, I have a grandfather buried there and I cannot find his grave. This, on the other hand, is the one of the three cemeteries in Alexandria, which is much better preserved and has not been touched. The two graves on the left here are the graves of my father's parents, my grandparents. This is the... Jewish community school in Alexandria, still as it stands today, you can see that there is Jewish lettering on top here. But if you go round to the entrance, it is now a Egyptian girls school. And underneath here, this is the Jewish hospital in Alexandria, where actually I was born, and which is now a teaching hospital for the medical faculty in Alexandria. About six, seven years ago, there was this, the ceiling of, part of the ceiling of the main Alexandria synagogue, the Eliyahu Hanavi collapsed. And we, with a group known as the Nebi Daniel Association, we offered to raise money amongst the diaspora of Egyptian Jews to restore it. But actually the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities to their full credit said, no, 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 we will do it ourselves. And they spent $4 million restoring the Alexandria Synagogue, which, if you remember what I told you a few minutes ago, amounts for about $1 million for Jew left in Alexandria today. They actually did an excellent work. This is a photo of the restored Alexandria Eliyahu Hanavi Synagogue. And this is the interior. It was as it was built in Italian style by an architect. You see they had 12 marble columns. You can see the arc at the end. And what is interesting, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, there, when they were repairing, they during excavations, they found remnants of a older synagogue dating from the 13th century. Anyway, the uh, restoration was completed in 2019. There was an official inauguration of it, but it was a totally, let's say, secular celebration. There was no uh, prayers were said. Nobody wore any kippah or covered their head. No members of the Jewish community outside Egypt were invited. It could have been the inauguration of a post office. So this is why with a few colleagues from our organization, the Nibi Daniel Association, we decided to organize a return trip to Egypt for a Hanukkah Tabayit, so a rededication of the synagogue and to conduct Shabbat services on Friday night and uh, Saturday morning with a visit to the cemeteries to say Kaddish on the Friday morning. We there were 180 of us who traveled there, the largest group or attendance or congregation since probably 1970. 
And uh, as I said, 180 Jews from Egypt returned to Alexandria with a lot of them, their children and their grandchildren. And I'm now going to show you two extracts of what was happening there. The first at the cemeteries and the second at the synagogue. Excuse me. Shokin <laughs> Cohen. <laughs> Shlomo ben Yehuda Fedida, Raphael Yaakov Galanti, Itzrak ben Emmanuel Nakamuli, Gabriela Nakamuli, Megam Robert Rollo, Linda Rollo. And now I will show you the ceremony of rededication at the synagogue. Hang on. So where we bought six Sefer Torah and replaced them in the ark. And you can see how beautiful the synagogue is. Ahora <laughs> So you notice how everybody cried Hazak, which is the Sephard in Mizrahi sort of Yishkoya, after somebody has been called up for an Aliyah or has read the parasha or blown the shofar. So that was February 2020. We were lucky. It was two weeks before the whole COVID uh, for, uh, restrictions on traveling uh, were imposed. And since then, what's left? Basically, only the names. There are eight Jews. The synagogues stand there. 
As you know, in a lot of Sephardi Mizrahi synagogues, the seats are allocated with a nameplate. And when I first went back to Egypt in about in the mid 1980s, they asked me if they want I wanted to unscrew the plate and take it with me. And I thought about it and I decided to leave it there because that's where it belongs. It would have come back in London, ended up at the bottom of a drawer and probably been thrown out by accident. But that's where it belongs because really today of the 85,000 Jews, only the names remain. Thank you. Alec, thank you so much. This was outstanding. And there are so many kind comments in the chat, um, including people who are from the Egyptian Jewish community from around the world. Um, really honored to have you here with us today and to discuss this community so close to Passover as well. I'm wondering if you have some time to take questions. Absolutely. Okay, I have compiled as many as I could, and I'm going to try to pick out the ones that I saw the most. Yeah. Um, so questions about the Egyptian Jewish relationship to Passover. How did Egyptian Jews celebrate the holiday? Did they use a different Haggadah? Um, no, we use the we use the same Haggadah. The the main difference is, I mean, we have the ten plagues. Every family has their sort of tradition. Uh, some people, as you know, dip the finger into the uh, the 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 glass of wine and drain it on a saucer. My father would used to pour ten little portions of it, one for each uh, plague. Uh, as I said, the main dis the main uh, differences were dietary. The fact that we would have rice and lamb and very much meat oriented. And also what we used to, one of my favorites any, anyway, were the Hamino eggs. So those are eggs which are hard boiled for eight to 10 hours with uh, onion peels and all that. And they turn out a sort of creamy brown. Delicious. Um, yeah. The other question was kind of about how, I think the, the major question is also, how did non-Jewish Egyptians feel about that Passover celebration? Maybe what was the relationship there, if any? Well, to a certain extent, as I said, we all lived happily together. And it was very common that non-Jews uh, non were invited for Passover seders, or we would be invited to Christmas parties or Easter celebrations or whatever. The ones who really celebrated Easter were the whole Greek Orthodox community. Christos Anesis, you know, Christ has resurrected. And speaking of um, Egyptian Christians, we had another question. Oops, that maybe, did I lose it? No, okay. What was the Jewish community relationship with Egyptian Christians? And did it look particularly different from the relationship with the Muslim community? No, I... In those days, religion wasn't an issue in terms of social or business relations. You know, you socialized with people you enjoy socializing in, with, and you traded with people who, you know, were beneficial to trade with. The issue of religion didn't come up. That's really beautiful. Um, we have... Sorry, I'm I'm looking uh, for more. Oh, okay. Kind of some questions about um, what the synagogues are used now, and a bit more of what of the what was what is the motivation, in your opinion, if you can share, if you're not comfortable sharing, that's yeah. okay too, um, of the Egyptian government for preserving these heritage sites. Okay, I th I think they. They do say that, you know, they, you know, Egyptian, now they are saying Egyptian Jews are part of our history. They are beginning to rediscover this. Is it because they want to curry favor with the United States, which keeps them financially afloat? If it is it because they want to, like we have in Eastern Europe, see a resurgence of Jewish tourism? I don't know. Unfortunately, as I said, after the restorations in Cairo, Alexandria, first we had COVID, which of course stymied every single travel plan for at least two to three years. 
And then, of course, now you've got this situation till 7th of October. And, uh, you know, obviously, I don't see many people going back at, the, at this point in time to visit synagogues or Jewish cemeteries. Yeah, um, we have another, oh yeah, kind of a related question. Um, why did Jews stay until 1967? So kind of why why were there why were there Jews that um held out? I think a lot of there were quite a few who felt Egyptian, who did not want to leave, also could not see a future for themselves in Europe or whatever. They didn't have they they had a business which was not transferable to um to Europe or the United States or South America or um they uh, there was that or they were too poor to see how they would survive and uh, probably some of them don't didn't speak uh, foreign languages and then we you had we had a few and those are the ones who mainly remain now jewish women who had sort of married either cops christians or muslims and remained with their families Speaking of, I love how all the questions are leading into each other. There was a question about, were there many intermarriages? Limited. There were limited intermarriage, but there were intermarriage. Absolutely. All right. Um, okay. What is the impetus behind King Farouk's anti-Semitism? How did we go from this golden age to explosive anti-Semitism with him? Was there always an anti-Semitic undercurrent? I think that there might have been an anti-Semitic undercurrent. It really blew up in 19, from 1936. You had to, to a certain extent the conflicting rising of Zionism on one hand and uh, Egyptian nationalism on the other. Uh, Farouk, and incidentally, you ought to remember that in the 1920s, you had the same people, the Katawis, the Menashes, the Rolos, who sat on the at the head of government or in uh, the chairmen of the banks, and at the same time were uh, presidents or chairmen of the Zionist Federation of Egypt. Because, and now that seems today to be a contradiction, but in those days, don't forget, they shared one objective was to get rid of the British. And I think in terms of Farouk, I think I probably believe that it was more directed towards hoping that the Germans would help him get rid of the Brits. If the British had been defeated at Al Alamein, of course, you don't know what would have happened under German occupation, but that's another matter. Uh, there are two more questions that I really want to focus on because I don't want to keep um, everyone for too long. But one question that I saw was, can you talk more about Israel's intentions to have Egyptian Jewry move to Israel? Did many Jews want to move there or not? They were, particularly those who I would say not so fine. So well, quite a few of them moved there out of, out of idealism, Zionism. There were some who actually financially impaired did not see how they could survive in France, in Europe, or in uh, the United States, and moved to, to Israel. And as we know, they were not particularly well treated. All the immigrants from the Arab countries, Iraq, Egypt, Morocco, were confined to the Ma'abarot and really treated rather disparagingly and condescendingly by the quote-unquote uh, Ashkenaz elite. But however, the Jews from Egypt contributed significantly to in Israel. For instance, at the moment, everybody's talking about drones. The drones were developed by a Jew from Egypt in Israel for Israel Aircraft Corporation. Finally, there's a question that recurred a few times in relation to Jewish presence in Egypt for a long time. Yep. Um, who were the indigenous Jews of Egypt? I think also a good question is how are how are we defining um, indigeneity in this context? Okay, when I when I sort of was talking during my talk about indigenous Jews as opposed to immigrants, 
were mainly the Jews who were in Egypt, you know, up until and throughout from 1860s, as opposed to those who came from Italy, France, uh, Salonika, Turkey, Middle East, uh, from 1860 onwards. If you're looking now to the biblical narrative, uh, perhaps, um, you know, one of the, you know, we there is no archaeological proof that Jews were in Egypt at the time of the, let's say, the building of the pyramids. I am actually a volunteer guide on ancient Egypt at the British Museum. And one of the facts is that there is no, um, there is no uh, hieroglyphic inscriptions talking about Jews. And also, the after 1967, when Sinai was, as you know, occupied by Israel, every single amateur and professional archaeology rushed to Sinai, and they couldn't find one archaeological trace that there might have been a tribe that have gone round there in circles for 40 years. Not one shard of pottery, not one bone. So there's something you can discuss at your Seder in three weeks time. Quite a talking point. Um, oh, and I guess it's relevant. Okay, will you write a book? <laughs> there, are several, there are several books that have been written about the Jews from Egypt, much better than I would be able to do. If anybody's interested, I've got a bibliography I can send you, Mira, uh, of all the Jews books that have been written about what I call the age of Belle Epoque and uh, Egyptian Jews, which there's it's already been covered. So that's a yes, please, from several people in the chat. I guess finally, I know I said finally like two questions ago, but if you can't tell, we're all having an amazing time because you're a great presenter and we're all really interested in what you have to share. Um, what is the origin of your surname Nakamuli was a question that was in the chat. Well, my, my surname is comes from Nahamu, consolation, the lamentation of Jeremiah, Nahamu, Nahamu. My family, if you're interested, originally comes from Venice. If you go to the ghetto in Venice, you will find Nakamulis on the walls of the synagogue there. Also, if you go to the old Jewish cemetery on the Lido Island, there are graves with Nakamuli. And then at one point, a lot of the Venetian Jews followed Venice when Venice was expanding commercially. And my family settled in Corfu in Greece. And it was in the probably 1865 that my great grandfather arrived in Alexandria. My mother's family is uh, Syrian Aleppo. Thank you so much, Alec. This has been an honor and I'm really looking forward to sharing the recording with everyone and um, also looking forward to your bibliography. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for hosting me. Of course. Um, and I will send follow-up information to everyone. Thank you all, our travelers, for joining us as well and have a happy Passover, everyone. Yeah. Haksameh to everybody.